Welcome back. If you missed our first video, introducing the concept of media literacy and why it's important, I encourage you to visit our YouTube channel or our Facebook page and watch that one first. Now today, let's talk about the history of disinformation and some current examples. It's important to know that this is not a new phenomenon, though it certainly manifests itself in new ways. In medieval Europe, there was the problem of anti-Semitic blood libel. This was a false and superstitious accusation that Jewish people ritually sacrificed Christian children at Passover to obtain blood for unleavened bread. It was a rumor that resurfaced periodically over the years and was used again in 1930s as a part of Nazi propaganda. In early America, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, when running as political opponents, smeared one another in the newspapers. And the newspapers themselves went through a period in the 1890s where they employed yellow journalism, sensationalizing and hyperbolizing stories to sell papers. During the Cold War, Russian disinformation purposefully spread false stories. For example, that AIDS had been man-made by the Pentagon or that wealthy Americans were adopting children to harvest their organs. And of course, we have many recent examples of disinformation as well. They might be better understood by breaking them into the five following methods. So method one, foreign actors set up fake social media sites to incite and troll. These tactics were also emulated by domestic sites in the 2018 midterms with Facebook accounts and pages that falsely indicated widespread popularity for the ideas that they wanted to promote. For information on international coverage and how bots are used to spread disinformation, the University of Oxford has a computational propaganda project worth visiting at the link included below. Method two is hyperpartisan websites, pretty self-explanatory. Method three, domestic agents peddling conspiracy theories. So for example, in 2016, the Washington Post and Business Insider both debunked false information spread by partisan websites and political blogs that humanitarian George Soros owned a company that manufactured voting machines that were going to be used to manipulate votes in favor of Hillary Clinton. You can consider video clips debunked by factcheck.org that were shared on Facebook implying that Trump mocked George Floyd being unable to breathe when in reality he was mocking political opponents whom he claimed had choked politically. So method four is misleading political advertisements involving micro-targeting. So these are ads created specifically for your biases and interests as determined by your posts that you like, share, comment on. So if we're 100% agreeing with everything that we're seeing in our news feed, that might not be a good thing. And method five, spreading fraudulent election day information. So for example, Twitter reported that the vast majority of content removed from their service on election day in 2018 was voter suppressive content. And voter suppression is just what it sounds like, um, fraudulent news as well as other tactics designed to suppress voter turnout. There was even a commonly used hashtag on Twitter and Facebook with the wrong date, hashtag vote November 7th. And you can read PEN America's report, Truth on the Ballot, link below, for more examples of tweets aiming to dampen voter turnout, spread fear of non-existent voter fraud, and stoke distrust in the voting process. So thank you for joining me. Join me next time to explore creation and spread of disinformation.